From the Auto Line Studios, here is your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on Auto Line this week. The discussion topic for today's show is all going to be about where in the world is this automotive industry going? And the reason that's going to be the topic is because I've got three economists here whose job it is to look at the world and figure out where this automotive industry is going, including Emily Kalinsky, the chief economist at the Ford Motor Company, Charles Chesborough, the senior principal economist at IHS Automotive, and Mustafa Mahataram, the chief economist at General Motors. Great to have you all back on the show here. Thanks Thank so you. Much. Charles, let me start with you. Uh, everybody wants to know, boy, car sales are going red hot. Is, is the American market at its all-time peak? Is it going to keep on growing? What's your outlook for 2016 here and maybe even beyond? Well, I think we, in 2015, we had a fantastic year, uh, hit record numbers, and I think that trend's going to continue. It's really kind of a, a perfect storm in a good way for the uh, automotive buyer out there. Uh, interest rates remain low, gas prices are low, uh, job creation is strong. Really, all the ingredients that we would want in a robust market are all out there. And uh, as far as we can tell, it's going to continue probably for the next, certainly for the next 18 months or so. And then we start seeing some concerns when we get on the horizon and interest rates getting higher. That, that could uh, cause a hiccup. But until we get then, things are looking very strong. Okay, we'll get into some of that a little bit down the road stuff in a moment here. But Emily, do you see it the same way? I think that's a good assessment, the, the perfect storm analogy. We have a lot of favorable tailwinds that we experienced in 2015, brought us to the highest level we'd seen since the year 2000. And most of those factors look to remain in place here in 2016. We have low commodity prices, including oil and gasoline. And we're going to get into more of that in a moment, too, right? I, I knew we would. <laughs> and uh, the low interest rates, as Charlie mentioned, you know, will have a little bit of an upward slope. But by all expectations, it should be fairly gradual and not something that generates any immediate tailwinds. And the labor markets have improved to a degree that it's now generating some reasonably good job and income growth for customers, so it really is a pretty nice environment out there. And Mustafa, how do you see it? What, what, what a change. <laughs> Three or four years ago, the first question people were asking is, will the industry ever get above 17 million? You know, the kids weren't driving anymore and there were all these alternatives and I kept saying, no, history is going to repeat and we're going to recover. We are, you know, and we're in the sweet spot for the industries. Emily mentioned, strong job markets, relatively strong economy, low oil prices, low interest rates, what can go wrong, right? I think there's nothing that I see that suggests there's a change coming in that. And it's really interesting, you know, I know we're going to talk more about interest rates, but GM's North America economists looked at data and said, you know, there's a strange, interesting observation here. The first year after the Fed raises interest rates, sales always increase. In large part, that because the Fed increases interest, interest rates because the economy is doing very well. I, I do want to expand. It's not just the U.S. Both Canada and Mexico are at all-time peak also. So this is a North American industry that is doing exceptionally well. Why is that? And I'd, I'd like to all of you to weigh in on that. I mean, uh, Canada's economy was roaring along largely, in, or to a large part, I should say, because of commodity prices. China softened up and all of a sudden things uh, didn't look so good from the commodity standpoint, but the Canadian economy continues to go, grow strong. And, and Mexico, which has had all these issues, you know, security, crime, drug wars, and, and, and it's doing pretty well too. Yeah. Well, let's start with Canada. Yes, clearly they were hurt by the commodity price crash. But Canada has two things going for it. Ontario and Quebec, the two largest provinces in terms of people, do have a lot of industry that's benefiting from a much weaker Canadian dollar. And second, you'll see, because the new Prime Minister Trudeau is going to rub it in our face, is Canada's allowing a lot of immigrants to come in. And those immigrants are generally high income, high skill, and they're buying cars when they land in Canada. So that's a Canadian story that, yes, the Western provinces are being hurt, by the commodity price crash, but it's being offset to a large extent by what's going on in Ontario and Quebec, the industrial heartland of Canada. When you go to Mexico, two things are happening. One, the economy is very solid. I mean, Mexican interest rates, even though they're higher than ours, have never been this low. There's a lot more confidence in the economy in Mexico. And the second is that they did make some changes in their vehicle regulations where they used to get you know, half a million used cars from the U.S. 
that's really slowed down the trickle. So with the used cars no longer available, people have to buy new cars if you're going to maintain your fleet. So both much greater confidence in, the, in their own economy as well as this change is accounting for the. Other observations on Canada and Mexico? Well, Mexico certainly has had a, a nice run as, as Canada has. Uh, and Mexico also has the advantage of having sort of low cost production capability. And it's been attracting a lot of jobs. We've seen a lot of manufacturers uh, set up shop now in Mexico, uh, much more so than in the recovery period than when we were before. Uh, and so we've seen a lot of new jobs go, go to Mexico. And they have these free trade agreements where it makes a very attractive place to, to be building not only vehicles, but all kinds of things uh, to ship north, to ship north to trade uh, 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 duty free to, to Canada and the United States, as well as to go south and, and hit the other Latin American countries down there. So it's really kind of in a nice sweet spot right now uh, in terms of job creation uh, and, and the new industries that are moving there. And Mexico has also implemented some structural reforms over the past few years that are beginning to bear fruit. The reforms in the energy sector are not having an immediate impact right now. Obviously, with prices where they are, there's not a whole lot of investment coming in, although that may happen in the medium term. But they also had some reforms in the financial services sector that helped free up the credit markets, and I think that's been helping to support the economy and the auto industry as well. And similarly in Canada, we have the same interest, low interest rate story you know, and very uh, freely available credit in Canada that has been another factor supporting the industry and helping density levels to return you know, on an upward trend. They had been very flat uh, over a mm -hmm. long period of time in Canada, so we're beginning yeah. to see a little bit of density growth. Coming back to the U.S. market, Emily, you said something interesting. What if wages start to go up here? I mean, we the average household, as you well know, has seen its income flatline for two decades, inflation adjusted. What if we start breaking out of that? What if we, maybe the UAW contract of 2015 helped kick that off. What if we really start to see strong wage growth in the U.S.? What could that do to car sales? Well, it can only provide a further tailwind to what we've already seen. Uh, we, we have had some improvements in regard to wages and the, the pace of wage increases. The overall levels, as you point out, um, haven't you know, made a significant move as of yet, but you will begin to get some cumulative benefits from the, the monthly wage in, and income gains that we've seen. And that can only be good yeah. for the customer and for auto sales. I would say, though, if we do start seeing those numbers go up quite a bit, as, as we would all hope to, to see uh, workers' wages rise, that's what the Fed's waiting to see as well. And so that once uh, they start seeing those numbers really start to rise, that's when they're going really, to interest rates will go up are going to try and choke that off so we don't see, have any inflation. Yeah. And the other thing to keep in mind is cars are expensive. They're the second biggest purchase people make. As, if there's any job insecurity, that's not a decision you're going to make to purchase cars. And right now, the labor market is strong enough. You know, you're just not hearing of you know, large layoffs anymore. And that gives people the assurance to go buy cars. And I'll go back to my old hobby horse, which is the young people finally are getting jobs, entering the labor market. They're going to be buying cars. So I think, again, I go back to that. This, the U.S. auto industry, from a sales perspective, is in a really sweet spot right now. If wages rise, though, will that, maybe over time, it would induce people to buy new cars? Or is it just going to get them to buy better used cars or certified pre-owned cars in the interim? A hard question to answer because I haven't really looked at the data recently. But the reality is car, new cars are bought by families with above median income. So I don't see that changing very dramatically. I, I think you, you will see more people below the median starting to buy cars as their incomes rise and they become more confident. But I think the new car buyer is primarily going to be the above median income family. One thing I've been watching too is while the headlines are all focused on red hot car and light truck sales, I've been watching the medium and heavies and they're off to the races. I mean, so uh, for 2015, uh, the medium and heavy duty truck market grew twice as fast as the light vehicle market. I've always heard that economists like yourselves look at the heavy trucks, especially the big class eight semis, as a leading indicator of where the economy is going. Is there something that we can read out of these sales, Emily? Well, that is one positive signal that we've seen in terms of leading indicators around the industrial sector. There are some others that are a bit more mixed. Uh, in the second half of 2015, the data on freight, uh, for example, uh, freight volumes and loads were um, looking a little soft. 
Uh, so that may be sending, again, a little bit of a mixed signal. And we know that manufacturing in general in the U.S. has seen a little bit of a drag from the strong dollar. So there are sometimes special factors that go on in the, in the heavy-duty truck market in terms of pending regulations that may pull ahead demand, and uh, that could have been a little bit of a factor in 2015 as well. Other thoughts on trucks? Well, and certainly low gasoline prices can only help uh, help the truck market as well. I will say that I think the U.S. market's a little bit of an outlier when you look at the trucks globally. Uh, in most places around the world, or at least most of the big markets like China, uh, the heavy truck market's been doing terrible. It's been down quite a bit, uh, double digit, I think, last year and, and down as well this year. Uh, so we are a bit of an outlier, and I think we are starting to see the pace of these things slow a little bit. But and to the question you're asking more about the, uh, about the optimism in the market, it seems to me that what we've been seeing over the last few months is just the, the low gasoline prices have really kicked in with consumers. And there's nothing that makes you feel happy of the, about the world and happy about the day than paying a buck 69 a gallon. I mean, uh, uh, the world looks pretty good when you're paying that. And I think that uh, it took a little time. And we've had these low gasoline prices for about a year now, or maybe a little over a year. But there's so much volatility in gasoline prices, I don't think consumers really believed it initially. But now that we've been here for quite some time, I think it's really started to sink in that this is the real deal, that we're going to have these prices for, for quite a while. Cheap gasoline prices are almost like the, the biggest tax cut that the American public has ever received. Yeah, uh, it is. And, you know, it, it's remarkable how that changes things. And from the auto industry perspective, one of the good things is the money saved on gas is a, quite a significant portion spent on new cars. So, you know, Americans have more money in their pocket and more money that they're likely to spend on cars. And, uh, you know, really good news underpins the very strong vehicle sales we're seeing. Going back to trucks, it, it's an interesting observation globally right now that the industrial sector pretty much across the board is weak. But domestic demand, domestic consumption, pretty much across the world is much stronger than the industrial. But to support that domestic consumption, you have to move a lot of goods back. I mean, just think about, you know, all the goods that come into U.S. ports are manufactured here. Then they have to be shipped across. So the domestic economy is doing well. People are feeling confident buying. The goods have to be moved to them. So, you know, when Emily says that there's been some slowdown in freight, that begins, does concern me because that means not as many goods are being moved. But... I think if you dug deeper, you'd find that it has more to do with the industrial side than with the consumer side. Hmm. But I haven't done that, so I won't hang my hat on it. Okay, well, let's talk oil prices. Emily, uh, what's your advice to the Ford Motor Company? Is it plans what kinds of cars and trucks it needs to build apropos of oil prices, not, especially in the U.S., but globally? Well, we always put a wide range around our oil price forecast, and you know, we're very glad we do when we have you know, prices dropping as quickly as they did. Uh, over the course of the last you know 12 plus months so um, we advise having a range of potential outcomes in mind and in fact our portfolio supports that we have a well diversified portfolio across vehicles across powertrains to make sure that you know we can accommodate any outcome that may uh, occur with uh, with oil and gas prices Charles what do you think I'd Oil prices, how, how, how cheap do they stay for how long? Well, we're expecting in 2016, IHS Automotive expects that, that we're going to stay sort of in this low, inexpensive gas price environment, low oil price environment. But when you get sort of a little bit longer term and we start seeing the recovery in Brazil and Russia and, and other parts of the world, a little faster growth uh, from China, uh, we're expecting that oil prices will start to creep back up again and we're going to get back more towards uh, levels that we're familiar with uh, prior when they fell back in 2014. But I think it's going to take a long time till we're going to get to there. And we've had a fundamental change in sort of the structure of the oil markets uh, out there with OPEC cutting prices. That wasn't expected. We, it's always expected that they would pull back on production in order to keep prices high. Well, they, they've broken new ground by doing that. And uh, we think it's going to be very difficult for them to turn, that, turn the spigot off, I guess. And then we also have the Iranians are going to be joining the, uh, the world oil, oil market again. Uh, I think probably five, 600,000 barrels uh, a day are going to be added to the supplies next year. So uh, all of that's just going to kind of keep oil uh, at a rather inexpensive price, at least for the next, over the midterm. You see it that way, Mustafa? I, my mantra is lower for longer. I mean, people forget that we've seen this before. In 86, when the North Sea oil started coming onto the market, oil prices crashed. It was 2005 when China became a huge consumer that oil prices began to rise decisively. I don't see any reason why this time the outcome will be any different. That 
so much investment went in, people know where the oil is. So even if there's a temporary increase in oil prices, you will have production come back in very quickly. And, and we've seen this happen over and over again. So I think I'm very comfortable with the lower for longer outlook on you know, oil. I, I've talked to other people who do study this market, and that, their point is exactly yours, that even if you double oil prices from where they are right now today, they're still cheap. They're still below uh, recent standards. And that's what they kept saying is that, look, as the price goes up, we're going to uncap wells, more oil will come into the market, the price will come down again. And even if some of uh, the small fracking companies go out of business, the big ones are going to come in and buy them for pennies on the dollar, thus lowering their break-even point. And so two different sources I talked to said, as far out as they can watch right now, this goes out another decade or so, they don't see oil going over $80 a barrel on a consistent basis. Yeah, maybe there's a spike here or there, but yeah. not consistently. Yeah. And, and the other thing to keep in mind in that is, historically, oil has been a very capital-intensive business. You know, it would take billions to drill a well in the Gulf of Mexico. But once you've spent the money, then you produced. Fracking is the opposite. It's a very variable cost business. Cap the capital requirements are not that high. That's why I said if prices begin to go up, you'll see the rush back in because people now know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So th th there's another tailwind as you keep talking about. Hey there, Emily. Um, Hey, there's an, uh, another uh, element coming into the market right now. We're seeing a, a growing popularity of car sharing and ride sharing. Uh, car sharing being like Zipcar, where you know I might need a car, but maybe I only need it once or twice a week on an ongoing basis. So getting a taxi is way too expensive, and renting a car is too expensive. Zipcar and its competitors have found a sweet spot. Compared to ride sharing, kind of like Uber, where I whip out my cell phone, fire up the app, and in five minutes or so, I, I've got an Uber car there. These services are growing by leaps and bounds. It's a global issue. More and more competitors coming in. Have any of you looked at this and what it might do to car sales on a long-term basis? We've spent a lot of time looking at that issue over the past year, year plus, and We've kicked off Ford Smart Mobility, which is an initiative to get us to the next level in terms of connectivity, autonomous vehicles, customer experience, and all that, of course, is supported by you know, data and analytics um, that both go into and come out of that process. So it's a really exciting, dynamic time for the industry. It presents a tremendous opportunity, I think, for uh, both new entrants and for traditional manufacturers, if they get that equation right, uh, to really provide some exciting new offerings to the customers. Well, I know at the 2015 Consumer Electronics Show, Mark Fields went out as one of the keynotes and said, mm -hmm. we're not calling it the Ford Motor Company, we're calling it the Ford Mobility Company. That's right. <laughs> we are getting there. We are getting there. It's a very exciting time. Mustafa, how about at General Motors? Well, I mean, you know, everybody's looking at the same developments. I have somewhat of a contrarian view on Good. It. I wanted you to hear, uh, to, to People talk about this. forget that all of these things existed before. You know, living in South Side of Chicago, going to graduate school. I could go get a jitney cap. I could po put a poster up in the student union and say, I need to go to Ohio. Anybody else going there? What has changed is both the acceptance of the jitney car, which is Uber, and ride sharing, and the technology that underlies it. So the technology costs of sharing have really dropped with all these apps. And therefore, that's, you know, supporting this growth in this market. Will it impact the auto sales? I seriously doubt that because you look at where Uber is the strongest. It's New York, it's San Francisco, it's Brussels. These are places where you didn't sell very many cars. So people, my expectation is once people realize what personal mobility can give you, that may actually increase the demand for personal mobility. So, but as an auto manufacturer, you have to anticipate these changes, how, how technology is going to change behavior. And clearly, as, you know, as Emily mentioned, we're looking at experimenting with a variety of different concepts in this sort of space. We don't know which one will really fly, but you also can't set it out. And fortunately, again, the cost of entry into that is not that high, you know, compared to what it costs to develop a car or to build a new assembly plant. Developing an app 
is a reasonable proposition. So mm -hmm. I think you'll see more of that. You will see more innovation. And that's what makes it so exciting, is that there's just so much innovation going on, so much new thinking is being brought to the mobility arena that, you know, for all I know, it could, you know, as much of a historian and skeptic I am, this could completely redefine the industry. And you have to be prepared. And, and there are those who do believe it will yeah. redefine the industry. We'll get into more of that, but I want to hear from Charlie first. Well, clearly uh, these new technologies and these new applications are having an impact on the industry, but I, I'm with Mustafa on this. I don't, at our, at our IHS Automotive, we've looked at this and we just don't see, uh, uh, it's more of an incremental chipping away at sales than it is sort of any huge segment of the population that's opting not to buy a vehicle at all. And it is pretty concentrated in an urban environment. It's looking for a very specific type of person that would use these services as opposed to, to having their own vehicle. Uh, but clearly, as the technology advances and we get into you know, driverless uh, vehicles and all of those things, uh, and the population ages and the younger folks are more, more comfortable with the technology than, than old guys like me, uh, I think uh, we may see much more of an impact uh, from these new services. But at this point, I think it's still a little too early to say that they're going to have any kind of significant impact over the near term on vehicle sales. But, but, but you guys are all the economists, and isn't this really all about economics? In a way, convenience, for sure, in, in uh, city centers that are very congested, hard to park and all that, but economics, too. And, and the reason I say that is, as you all know, you know, I go to buy a car, I have to give the dealer a couple of grand for a deposit, I take years to pay it off, I have to insure it, I have to fuel it, I have to maintain it, and it's parked for 22 hours a day. So according to the AAA, you add all that together, it's 58 cents a mile. That's, according to the AAA, for the average American who, who is in new cars, about $8,700 a year. What if all this car sharing and ride sharing says, hey, we'll do it for 4000 a year? Will not a lot of households say, man, I'd love to save about four grand a year? John? I think, oh, oh sorry. Yeah. I, I keep hearing that. That's not paying attention to the math or the economics. In the morning when you want to go to work and you live in suburbia, if everybody else is doing the same thing, how are you going to do that? How many, you know, you'll have all these cars that people want to rent at the same time. So there's a real issue with sequencing in this. Uber and all work if the demand is distributed across the day. If it's all at the same time in rush hour, they don't work. Then it breaks down. Yeah. The second is, you know, how long have governments promoted car sharing? You know, you can have favorable parking if you're ride sharing. You can... Go on oh, HOV lanes if you car share. If that didn't drive you know, new car purchases out of the market, I don't think this is going to do it. Mm -hmm. As Mustafa mentioned, most of the new vehicle buyers in this country today, and so let's just talk for the moment about the U.S., because emerging markets, this may be a, a very different story when you're talking about first-time buyers. But here in the U.S., if you're an above-average income household, this new mobility solution has to be better in some way. And just being lower cost may not be enough. It has to be convenient. It has to be better than getting in your car and being able to go exactly where you want when you want to. In urban areas, that may make a lot of sense, so, you know, with parking and congestion issues. But that's not the demographic of the U.S. as a whole. That's the demographic of certain areas of the U.S. So by no means does new mobility mean the death knell of the traditional vehicle, at least not based on what we know today about the likely path of technology or the way that people live and work and use their vehicles right now. Why do you think all think that Google and Apple are so focused on the automotive industry right now? Do you think it's to build cars or to provide mobility services? Well, if you look at the revenue uh, in the auto industry today, we estimate that over $2 trillion in revenue globally comes from the sort of OEM piece of the pie. Transport services and other sort of tangential products and services uh, represent over $5 trillion. So if I had to guess, I would say they'd probably be going after the bigger slice, uh, the bigger pie, but uh, I certainly don't know what their specific plans may be. Any other thoughts? Well, from some of the presentations I've seen from some of these companies, you know, they kind of view the vehicle as a data vacuum, and it's just going to drive around town connecting to every Wi-Fi it can and just suck up whatever data, user data, you know, from the, from the driver that's sitting in the, in the cockpit, uh, getting all their bio information. Uh, so I think they're thinking much more beyond just 
getting from point A to point B, as, as Elming was saying, they're thinking big picture, what are all the different things we can do with all this data we're going to collect, uh, uh, as well as the transactions of how they can be involved in the, you know, the, the, the purchasing of the, even just the few moments I'm going to be using this vehicle, get into the, sort of the transaction pricing and all of that uh, is where I think they're thinking the money's going to be. But I, I would say to them, uh, building cars is a complicated business, and a lot of folks have tried, and uh, uh, I don't know that they're going to find it an easy road to go down it if and when they, they get serious about it. I take a little bit of a different view. I'm, I'm kind of with you guys. I'm not so interested in sharing my car and probably not interested in sharing a car, but I personally believe it is going to be a big disruptor for the business, for the automotive business. Not in the next three, four, five years, definitely in the next 10 and beyond that. And on a global basis, to your point, Emily, that it, you know, might make more sense in developing nations than it does in oh, the developed ones. Oh, I would ones. strongly disagree with that. Okay, well, that's going to be another show then, <laughs> because with this, we're going to have to wrap it up. I want to thank all three of you. Emily Kaz uh, Kalinske from Ford, Charles Chesborough from IHS Automotive, and Mustafa Mahataram from General Motors. Great having all three of you here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, John. And I want to thank all of you for having tuned in.